In an area with no big rivers and without a water table, how could water be supplied to its thousands of inhabitants? The extensive marshes to the east and west of the site may be what attracted Tikal's first occupants, and their water and wetland management was extremely ingenious and efficient. Remember that at its peak, the Great Tikal had a population of 40 to 60,000. Sustainable water supply solutions had to be found. So what did the Mayans do? First of all, on the edge of the swamps, the fields were raised and landscaped, and canals were built to irrigate or to drain them. In all societies, water is essential. In the case of Peten, located in the central lowlands, they had the advantage of having surface waters, such as lakes and rivers. And it's a tropical forest. It's not a rainforest because it has a dry season. And it surprises people with all of the rain they have per year. In the Maya world, you can have uh, anywhere from three to six months without rain. So they had to be able to stock water during the dry seasons. Secondly, and certainly on the initiative of several rulers, the Mayans performed a feat of engineering by creating huge reservoirs of drinking water at the heart of the site to supply the elite who lived there and their dependents. How did they do it? Ever since ancient times, the Mayans had developed a whole technique that you could call hydraulic engineering. They designed their cities in such a way that the squares became open-air catchment areas that could direct water to the reservoirs. The, the giant reservoirs uh, were, uh, a lot of they were quarries mostly, and it's interesting because as the city grew, you would need to dig more to construct the temples. At the same time, you're basically making your reservoir bigger. The reservoirs, like all the major architecture, were made of porous limestone, and they were covered with clay to waterproof them. To supply them, the Mayans came up with the idea of using their big buildings. The large reservoir south of the central Acropolis collected the water that fell on this building. Thanks to the stucco covering all the buildings, the rainwater and the violent monsoons all flowed down them easily. This was due to the slope of the buildings and their height. The water ran down to the Great Square, which was built with a slight slope to it, and the underwater pipes then carried it to the reservoirs. But the water did contain impurities. How to solve it? The Mayan solution to this was to use quartz sand that they placed over the clay layer of the reservoir to filter it. They invented a filtration system to clean their water. We deduced from this that the first tank was a kind of filter that let water through to reach the so-called temple reservoir a little higher up. So obviously the water management was part of real urban planning in Tikal. It can also be seen in this residential area near the central Acropolis with its sumptuous palaces. In five centuries, the Mayans built here 42 edifices on a platform that would reach a length of 235 yards. These palaces served as homes for the elite, as well as administrative centers. These were residential areas, of course, residences of an abundant and varied population. There were reception areas too, as well as meeting areas. The spatial organization of a Mayan city is different to anything we know. You won't find adjoining buildings opening onto streets, but groups of houses organized around an inner courtyard. This complex building to the east of the central Acropolis is a noble or royal residence. At just 100 meters from the ceremonial center, it was definitely the home of somebody powerful. At Tikal, uh, one thing people don't realize, there are many palaces. 
because the high nobles uh, had palaces, and uh, so as you you know you you only see a small part of the site, and they had pillows and they had cushions, and uh, in addition to uh, you know it, uh, making it comfortable, it gets cold at night in the jungle, and as you know, I mean the castles in Europe, you know. We, very uncomfortable, and they would have big fireplaces. Um, but um, so that was part of making it uh, endurable. The floors of these well-to-do homes were covered with stucco. They didn't have the gray limestone aspect that we see today. Thanks to the reconstruction by CGI, we can now get a glimpse of the Mahler Palace. we can see that there is an important difference between the civil architecture of the elites and the religious architecture. The religious buildings were built vertically, while the residences were horizontal. Even with its two floors and its rich ornaments, the Mahler Palace is mostly horizontal. Also, what's fascinating to me is that, you know, he's sitting there on the great throne and there's incense and there's smoke pouring out, but there's also music, impressive music and so on. Again, it's all a stage. Everything from the main plaza to the little um, courtyards for rulers or nobles, it's all about theater. Let us discover now the biggest pyramid in Tikal, a giant almost 200 feet high and weighing millions of tons, Temple 4. 650 yards west of the main square, Tikal's majestic Temple 4 is the tallest pre-Columbian structure in the Americas still standing. It is a giant that reaches a height of 213 feet, almost as high as Notre Dame de Paris. This pyramid temple was certainly a funerary monument. It has the same characteristics as all the others. Just to estimate the construction materials needed to erect this pyramid and its platform can make your head spin. Nearly seven million cubic feet of them and all carried up on men's backs and that took a workforce of hundreds of men. At the summit of Temple 4, the arduous ascent is rewarded by a sumptuous panorama of the site. To look out over the forest canopy is like being on top of the world. The roof comb alone is over 40 feet high. Inside it, the openings between its three rooms were topped with beautiful carved wooden lintels. The rooms were narrow and the walls colossal. Setting the lintels in place cannot have been easy because the sapodilla wood they're made of is heavy, more than one ton per 35 cubic feet. The men who carried them all the way up here must have suffered. Each wooden lintel is well over six feet high. In addition to their beauty, these panels have secrets to reveal. Thanks to the carved inscriptions, we've been able to date Temple 4 precisely it was built in 741 AD. Back then in the 8th century, the city became so dense with so many new occupants arriving that the sovereigns were constantly building new constructions among the biggest the city had seen. Much of what we see today dates from that time. An incredible technological invention is revolutionizing all our knowledge of Mayan civilization. A laser detection technique called LIDAR. With its help, we can now see through dense layers of trees. This is an extraordinary leap forward for research. It would have taken an archeologist a century to discover what back in 2016 the LIDAR unearthed in just two days. 
LIDAR is terrific at discovering canals, changes in the landscape, cultivation terraces, anything that can be hidden by vegetation. There are all the buildings, of course, but you can also see the outlines of fields and terraces, the exploitation of wetlands, the paths connecting the different neighborhoods, as well as roads linking different sites. And, you know, a place like Tikal, they've only excavated, I don't know, 10, 15 percent. And uh, so it really, it really helps, especially, um, it helps in the beginning. Uh, replaces a lot of ground survey, so you can see things. Since 2016, mapping with LIDAR has revealed Tikal to be much larger than archaeologists suspected. The Mayan villages built of perishable materials have all disappeared. The experts thought Tikal was surrounded by 3,000 structures, forming secondary centers or villages. But the LIDAR revealed not 3,000, but 12,000. For Tikal in particular, it showed us that the site was much more densely populated than we'd previously thought. It looks rural, this Mayan city, and that's unusual in the West. It's an urban center surrounded by a lot of farms. Around Tikal and its towns, there are large tracts of cultivated fields with intensive agriculture, terraces, drain fields and raised fields, which all ensure a large production of food to feed the population. This interweaving of town and country is what probably distinguishes these classical cities. And the LIDAR has opened a whole new chapter of understanding for us.